Okay, hi everybody. Can you hear me? Check, check, one, two, three. First, I want to, to, to make sure that you all can hear me. Uh, welcome to my stream today. My name is Luna. I'm a Vietnamese communist, uh, living, born and living in Vietnam right now. And I'm very happy to, to, to be here today. And I want to introduce to you our awesome, awesome Asians and indigenous comrades from all around the world. And we're going to talk about the U.S. military expansion today. And another happy news that I, we just got raided by Brazilian comrades. Wow! A communist raid, Brazilian communist raid. I'm so happy right now. Welcome you all to my show. And I promise you that this show not going to disappoint you because we're going to talk about the U.S. imperialism from the perspective of people of color and indigenous people from all over the world. And uh, I'm very happy, I'm very excited that now I'm going to introduce our awesome uh, guest today. Okay, <laughs> U.S. imperialism, never heard of it. <laughs> in Brazil. Wow, very happy. Welcome, welcome comrades. Welcome my awesome Brazilian comrades and also comrades from all over the world too. Uh, let's welcome our first guest, Silver Spook. Hey Hi. everybody. Aloha, can you hear me? Is it coming out? Yes. Oh, yes, uh, yes, hey, yes. Can you please introduce yourself to the, the audience? Um, Aloha, I'm uh, Silver Spook. Uh, I am a Native Hawaiian uh, activist, uh, defender of our uh, illegally occupied country of Hawaii here under the ongoing yeah. illegal U.S. occupation. Well, over 100 years, right? 100, yeah, 100 about 130 years. Right? years. Yeah, so um, anyway, so I don't know if you can read this chart, but if you don't take anything else, uh, remember, uh, Ola Ikavai, which means water is life in uh, Hawaiian, and uh, we need to uh, shut down Red Hill, so... Uh, we'll be talking about that yeah. certainly today because um, that's uh, yes. one of the major reasons why um, one of the major impacts of U.S. imperialism is the ongoing um, spilling of uh, tens of thousands of gallons of jet fuel into our water supply. Uh, we are right now being impacted by that. My family is being impacted by that. There are Hawaiians by the thousand, uh, including U.S. military that are being uh, poisoned, including little children. It's very sad babies uh, uh i was just looking at some pictures of what happens when you are bathing in jet fuel water uh, about a million people are currently threatened or impacted by this in oahu and that's just one of many impacts yeah. that we're currently trying to stop so anyway so uh so anyways yeah, i, I wanted to put this about it today yeah 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 asia pacific panel to talk about all of these impacts uh in the pacific and asia in particular um and yeah very much looking forward to it <laughs> yeah Okay, let's introduce our next guest. Hi, welcome to the show, Yaron. Uh, kia ora. Uh, my name is Yaron. Uh, I am a Maori activist from Aotearoa. Um, also here to talk about uh, Asia, the Asia Pacific and uh, the US's uh, saber rattling that they've been doing for a very long time, and also about uh, New Zealand's complicity in. Um, uh, in the actions that uh, the U.S. military conduct in the Pacific. Yeah, thank you so much for being here, Zeron. Finally, I have another chance to talk with you. Uh, now, let's introduce uh, Sha. Hi, how are you? Oh, we can't hear you, Sha. Yeah. Please check your microphone. Can you hear me now? Oh, yes. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Uh, my name is Sha Marire. I am a Micronesian Palawan uh, rabble rouser living in the United States right now. And um, I talk about this kind of stuff for a living. And so I am excited to get to do this today with you guys. Yeah, I'm very happy to have you here. And I believe that there's got to be great topics to talk about today. And now let's uh, meet our comrade, Yon. I don't know how to call you Yon, Yon or something, but I'll ask. Welcome to the show. Uh, hi. <laughs> Hello. Um, I'm a Korean communist born and I still live in Korea. 
and I'm here to just contribute to the conversation as much as I can. You can call me Yan. Yeah, uh, Yan. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I'm 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 so happy to have you here because I've been following you on Twitter for so long time now. Finally, I have a chance to talk <laughs> with you. <laughs> and okay, our last guest still busy a little bit. We will introduce him a little bit later. Okay, now everybody. So our topic today is going to be U.S. military expansion. And yes, of course, it, re it relates to, uh, uh, you know, uh, U.S. Im imperialism too. So um, first, I want to hear Super's book talking about, you know, the water poisoning situation in Hawaii right now and how the U.S. is actually doing this. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, it's such a it's such a big uh, topic. Uh, I'm I've been trying to keep up to date on it every day. Um, I think uh, Holly's in the chat. Holly is my partner that also both uh, helps me with the putting out links related to this information that I'm talking about. Um, so if you want a more comprehensive, um, uh, you know, uh, material that you can read about this, I would recommend looking this up. Um, but uh, Oahu Protectors on Twitter is a very good source for up to date information on this. Uh, there are active there are organization that um, is currently taking actions just this Thursday. Uh, anyway, but more specifically, what exactly is happening? So basically, uh, at this moment, um, the United States is currently, um, well, if you, if you don't know, just really quickly, the Red Hill tanks um, that I talked about earlier are part of, um, uh, they are a 200 plus million gallon, they're the largest uh, underground storage uh fuel tanks uh basically that the u.s has any they're like the, basically the largest uh fuel storage gasoline fuel storage tanks anywhere the u.s has in any of its bases um they basically fuel the entire i i sometimes it's described as the indo-pacific command but it's really the world empire command 26 countries have the largest the world's largest military games for imperialism which is you know threatening projecting power military force Etc. for global plunder yeah. under a capitalist structure. Hawaii is the place where world empire, the United States, AUKUS, obviously, UK, uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, uh, you know, Japan, India, anyone else who is complicit, uh, Israel, they all show up in Hawaii uh, and to, to blow, bomb multiple battleships uh, every two years to practice these war games. And, uh, and also, and their fleets that are currently sailing up and down the coast of China, uh, just crushing uh, Okinawa uh, with increased ex base expansion. They're building more bases here. Uh, and But Hawaii is a place where the Indo-Pacific Command, which is really the World Empire Command, it actually all goes all the way across all of Asia, Iraq, Vietnam, Korea, uh, Afghanistan, all the wars that the U.S., basically most of the wars the U.S. has fought have been staged, operated from, and launched from Hawaii, which is an illegal occupation. And that gas that is spilling in our water, it's, situ it's in... Huge underground tanks built, uh, you know, more than half a century ago, around World War II time, to basically power the entire U.S. empire's entire fleet, its navy, its air force, uh, uh, indefinitely uh, past World War II. And that gasoline, it was never built. Uh, it was built quickly. It was a huge undertaking uh, in an emergency um, or in an emergency. Uh, it was to continue to power the U.S. fleet. Um, uh, with a with a un, with a hidden storage tank uh, that the Japanese would have difficulty or an enemy force would have difficulty bombing. But that 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 gasoline is the fuel is uh, 100 feet above the largest aquifer. That's the freshwater source for all of our drinking water uh, of Oahu, largest source. Um, and 70 uh, percent of the island basically relies on this. It's a million plus people that rely on this. Um, uh, and so. And that it, they were known to leak. They've been studied over time. They've been proven to leak. The U.S. military has tried to cover this up for decades, for decades. Fifty years ago, there are internal documents describing that these these tanks are already endangering the water. That and and they have been. Um, I have you know sensed the impacts of this. Uh, I have family members who have had uh, rashes and other problems with their skin. Uh, it's unknown how much, how many diseases how many shortened lifespans from the decades of poisoning our water. This is just one way that they have harmed us. 
And this last year in November, in this past year, there was the most uh, extreme leak that was so bad. That entire household smelt like gas, like gas stations. Like if you just turn the tap on, the water in your sink was enough to make your entire house smell like a gas station. Um, people have chemical burns. Children, babies were vomiting up uh, their, their, their insides, uh, burns all over the body, just rashes, hospitalizations, people like literally passing out um, immediately from the water. Not like long-term impacts, just like immediately. Uh, dogs had to be put down uh, because they were spasming uncontrollably. Uh, uh, and the U.S. military has covered it up for its own troops, its own troops, infants, the children of colonels. That's a top 2% of the United States military. There's only, there's only less than 3,000 colonels. The uh, field grade officer, colonel, lieutenant colonel, and major's children also were lied to and their families, and they have been poisoned. The U.S. military has resisted multiple orders from the governor, from the Board of Water Supply, from the Department of Health to shut down Red Hill. The U.S. military is currently suing. It's suing the state of Hawaii, the state of Hawaii, what, what democracy? It's suing the state of Hawaii to keep the tanks open, to keep poisoning my, my family, my family, my, 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 my friends, uh, children, and to keep killing uh, Native Hawaiians. So uh, when the United States talks about defending human rights, uh, and that's just one of a litany, <laughs> obviously, but specifically ethnic minorities, human rights that are being violated by other countries the United States would like to uh, uh, point fingers at, like Mr. Blinken does all the time. Uh, it is currently, it has literally committed cultural genocide by banning our language and culture, and it is ongoing uh, uh, killing us in Hawaii with its military that's supposedly going around to defend human rights. So uh, anyway, I could go on this forever, uh, but I hope that the, the basic point is gotten across. That's why there's so many people from Steve Donziger, the number one human rights lawyer, who is currently being imprisoned by the United States for winning cases against oil companies, uh, from Noam Chomsky to Naomi Klein to uh, International Coalition, uh, Vijay Prashad, who I know, uh, Luna, you've worked with, uh, th th there's increased, increasing visibility for this, but only because we, like, you know, people like me, people like our fellow water protectors, and indigenous people that the U.S. doesn't care about in its own borders, have uh, did everything we can to raise visibility about this issue. Otherwise, the U.S. would just be happy to keep slaughtering us and killing us and its own colonel's children because it doesn't care. That's what you should know about the U.S. military. It doesn't care about you even if you are working for it. Your children are cannon fodder in their homes in the U.S. military bases. That's what you should know. So you should, you should quit immediately. Uh, quit the empire. Quit the police. Quit the empire. Quit every U.S. corporation if you possibly can manage it. But um, uh, anyway, I think that's probably enough for now. So I, I hope I get the point across. Uh, okay, thank you so much for this book, and we're gonna get back to this real quick. Now, uh, I want you to introduce our last guest. Uh, welcome, Kanja, to the show. Hi. <laughs> thank you. Can you please thank introduce you, uh, yourself? Uh, hi, I'm Carl Za. I, um, I am a, a, a Chinese person who had lived in U.S. For, uh, for nearly 30 years, and now I have repatriated back to East Asia. Now I'm on... <laughs> Uh, Bali, Indonesia. Uh, I feel honored to join this panel uh, with some very, very distinguished guests. And uh, you know, so Silver Spook, you know, there's never enough. Like you, you, the, the 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 kind of the crimes that U.S. committed against indigenous people across Pacific. This is, uh, I mean, this this will fill up an entire day just to talk about it. And. And the fact that the yeah. U.S. is using this opportunity is claiming, um, you know, on our behalf, they're defending freedom, they're defending human rights, they are they are somehow defending our safety from China, right? When when it's U.S. itself, it's like doing what all the things. hell? Yeah, and in fact, the yeah, and the know, thing I, going on with Elin Gu, you know, the, the things going on with Elin Gu, like is. Eileen Gu just break Eileen Gu just breaks American brains because how could this person <laughs> who is raised in US, grew up in US, could possibly could possibly go there and play for China? Because in the American mindset is that being everybody is a potential American, right? Everybody in the world is a potential American. That the end goal is to come to US and become American and fulfill the American dream, which is 
pay mortgage, you know, and and then that that's it. That's the end of history. That's the end of history, end of humankind. And Eileen Gu, by the, the mere act of go playing for Team China is a repudiation of this very shallow American identity. And that that's why people are so buttered and so triggered. And it's it's just yeah. it's just mind boggling. I mean, it's it's pretty ugly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, we just got a super chat from the Japanical communist. Uh, thank you so much. And the message is, I am an ex Navy and was stationed in Yokosuka. Literally nothing we did had anything to do with protecting Japan or the U.S. I mean, yes, that is the whole point of. You know the existence of military in the U.S. Back to the poisoning, the water poisoning in Hawaii. I mean, this is a thing that it's not even new, you know. But the thing is that, like the the the, the citizen in the U.S., they they are being blinded by their own states that they don't even know about this, and I mean, many of them they don't even care. I think to put in the terms that America, average American audience would understand, you know, we have to uh, think of Star Wars, right? <laughs> I think deep down, all Americans know this evil empire in Star Wars is actually U.S. And, and in, in fact, that Lucas, George Lucas himself in the interview said, yes, in Star Wars, the evil empire is U.S. and the rebels are the Viet Cong. He specifically said that, and we are just in denial that that somehow we are this freedom loving, <laughs> freedom loving empire. There's a there's a liberal myth that U.S. is somehow this benign hegemon, right? That that has brought peace and prosperity all over the world. And and you know to to paraphrase of this all these crazy China reporting around the Olympic is what at what cost, right? At, at what cost is the so called U.S. hegemony, and and we we know from the testimony of Silver Spook, Spook and and the, the the indigenous people all around the world, the cost is sovereignty, the cost is language rights, the the cost is our our literal our health. That is all to feed the military industrial machine that benefits actually a very few inside U.S. You know, like all seven hundred. We have like we just uh. U.S. just approved like what seven hundred sixty billion dollar military budget. Most of that goes to finance McMansions in Virginia, in Maryland, right? The, 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 what what does the average American get out of the American empire? They get a bill. They get their you know they, they get more taxes. Sorry, sorry for ranting. I'm just yeah. Oh no, it's all good. I also want to say thanks, thanks for thanks, Crawford, uh, coming on and. Uh... Uh, you know, always, always happy to <laughs> dunk with, dunk on imperialism with you. <laughs> Cheers. Uh, about Jan, I want to uh, know a little bit about what's the U.S. military has been doing in like Korea, you know, especially South Korea. Oh, uh, so here there has been recent public outcry in a small rural village in Sosongli where elders are being forcibly displaced from their villages and homes to make uh, space for the U.S. anti-missile defense system called THAAD, which stands for terminal, uh, Terminally High Altitude Area Defense. Uh, mm. Not only does this you know, contaminate or uh, ruin our environment. There has been, in places like Chuncheon, Daegu, Busan, Seoul, there has been toxic chemicals at up to 1,000 times the South Korea safety level here. And the U.S. military base, the U.S. military is of course dumping toxic chemicals and jet fuel into our water supply. Uh, people have developed health problems such as cancer due to this. Uh, and of course, you know, the South Korean government pays more money to keep the U.S. military bases in Korea, which not only threatens our sovereignty, independence, rights to land and self-determination. Uh, 
course, these things just, you know, these things threaten every aspect of our daily lives. Yeah. It's very concerning. Yes. Just, I, I mean, like when, when they claim, U.S. claim is it's defending the peoples of Asia Pacific by putting all those military bases. Uh, it, it, in actuality, it's painting a target on all these uh, all these parts. Now, now they become tar military targets. All these places would do fine without the military presence. In fact, you know, we have seen response from people in Korea, in Okinawa in hawaii people local people do not want the u.s military presence they don't they they, they nobody asked us to defend them <laughs> and and yeah yet this is all being used as a justification for you know just more grit for the in military industrial complex the thing is that like vietnam was also being to terribly contaminated by the u.s uh, you know the chemical warfare like you know they use like you know hundreds of barrels of toxins with like 366 kilogram of asian orange on vietnam the most poisonous like like substance that we the humanity has ever known of so things are like even like the world ended 50 years already but even to this day in like in a lot of like land of vietnam the vast like very vast land of vietnam still contaminated that we cannot grow anything from it and under it it was like we had to bury hundreds of barrels of toxin because we there's no better way to deal with it it's it it, it, it is a huge thing for our environment and not just in Vietnam, but also in Laos and, and Cambodia too. So the thing is that like, it is really extremely hypocrite for the USA to even point their fingers at us and saying like, you are destroying the environment, blah, blah. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? We are dealing with hundreds of barrels of toxins that you left after you lost the Vietnam War right here. And like, if you really care about us that much, you go here and take them back. They take them all back home and deal with them it is like disgusting it's, like that and i don't know it, i mean it's too disgusting it, it's amazing uh luna that you you get a lot of these american haters attacking you on internet like for what for defeating american imperialism like what are you angry at vietnam <laughs> for what, what, what do you get to angry about vietnamese people for it's it's just mind-boggling <sighs> Yeah, we didn't even do anything. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting that uh, I, I like Luna. You have that. Uh, you have a degree from your own university. So now Luna is a U.S. and U.K. expert. So <laughs> Luna's watching you now, because the Asia yeah. experts from the U.S., Asia experts from the U.S., they can't even speak the Asian language like Chinese that they're that they're that they're supposed to be experts on. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Dang it. A oh, lot of people feel attacked for this. You say like, oh, what do you mean? You mean you mean now like we can't criticize Vietnam unless we speak the language like Yeah. Have I ever <laughs> told you, you can't criticize Vietnam at all? I'm talking about those claim to be experts. Like they experts on Vietnam and they can't even speak our language. I'm so done with those people. That is why literally I'm Dr. Luna Oi now. US UK studies. Okay. Nice. <laughs> yeah, so so I want to hear from you, Shah, about, you know, your knowledge and your idea about all of this thing going on with U.S. military. So it starts with I'm the daughter of a man who was an activist against U.S. imperialism in the 80s. And this is like where my all my, I guess, young formative years started out. And so I'm, I think of it as I'm just kind of picking up from where my parents left off. But um in the 60s, the United States basically created a plan for how to get the Micronesian region to self-colonize. And so the Kofa Nations Compact of Free Association, we're all sovereign countries. We have our sovereignty that was given to us back 
by the US, how that works, I still don't know. Um, but with that sovereignty, there were some things we lost out on. Um, the Republic of Palau was the first nation in the world to have a constitution which included a nuclear weapons free clause in it. They made the Republic of Palau vote, let's see, it was 11 times um, to change the constitution so that they would accept turning it over with a simple majority versus three, four, uh, three fourths of the population. And so from then to where we are now, uh, we're under the compact, we're under this treaty with the United States where yes, we're sovereign, but we use US currency, we use the US post office, the Pacific islands, including American Samoa and Guam, per capita, the highest US military recruitment rate in the world compared to like any US states. Um, and it's the easiest way wow. off island if you can't get a scholarship, if you don't have the means to, to leave and go study abroad or, or just try to live your life abroad, you join the military. And everyone knows how much the US military loves to uh, exploit and recruit people in those positions. Um, we, I think roughly there's about 70 countries in the world uh, that have US military posts or installations on them. We're next in line because under those treaties, um, they can build bases on our islands now. Uh, the islands of Guam have lost what hundreds, if not a thousand, I believe acres of limestone forest because of military buildup. Oh. We're looking at mangroves being cut down and that's like a natural filtration system. That's what helps keep the waters clean. Um, those are cut down and that's just the environmental impact. That's not even taking into account what it's doing in terms of changing our culture, our community, what it's doing to the people. And because it's a treaty and we know how much the United States really loves keeping their treaties and promises. Um, basically it was 50 years of financial compensation for a lifetime of access to the land. And they can say that we voted for it, but if you have to vote for something 11 times because the US keeps making you, it's not really saying we voted for it. And so that's where we are now and it doesn't look good. I mean, even our leadership, uh, on a good day, they're polite and pragmatic and on a bad day, they're willing to sell us out to whoever the highest bidder is. So where does that leave us? I, uh, I heard as well that in, I believe Guam, um, they have installed Israel's Iron Dome there or are installing it. I've heard it, but I don't know the details or for sure on it. Yeah, I've I've yeah I've seen a couple of reports where they're either planning to or they already have installed yeah the Iron Dome that's also used uh, to violate Palestinians. Yeah, it's it's a mess out there, and before this started happening, we had activists from Hawaii telling us like please don't accept it, and for the most part, a lot of the population was like yes we get that we're trying to protect our home, but when you're from a country of twenty thousand people it's what can you do and because they're saying this is a build up to protect us from china um we weren't a threat to china you made us a threat to china so how does that really work that's like classic narcissist parent isn't it and yeah. now we're stuck in the middle and some of the islands exactly. have diplomatic ties with taiwan versus china some islands have diplomatic ties china and we're all like right next to each other and we were never we never had beef or issues with these places in the first place but thanks us for giving us so much that we really didn't want i really feel shy in this issue because vietnam you know like vietnam's been you know the usa been like trying all kind of means to force vietnam to join an alliance with the usa against china and this is very tiring, even though like our prime minister, our minister of like national defense clearly said that Vietnam will never join any like military alliance against any country and Vietnam will never allow any country to put military base in Vietnam. But like even to this day, lots of lots of Americans, I got to say, still saying to still laugh at Vietnam. They're like, oh, don't you see Vietnam is close allies to the USA? Vietnam will rather join the USA against China. Like, dude, what are you 
talking about? And they they brought up a bunch of like Pew Research poll or something about they asked like a maybe like a, like few hundreds people about their view on the USA. It's like, like, dude, it doesn't matter. This poll is like this is the official foreign policy of Vietnam that we know will not join any alliance against any country. So don't even dream about it. Talking about how much indoctrination the USA citizens are in this stuff and this issue, and then the thing is like the difference between Vietnam and Palau is that like Vietnam, we um we 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 had a revolution and we won the war. This is the true like you know self determination mean. The thing is that like we we Vietnamese communists, we've been talking uh, about this a lot too. Uh, those imperialist and colonialist countries when they gave some countries like you know independence freely like that it must be some price behind it and and yes and and palau is paying that price and right now the situation is very complicated yeah yeah Sha, Sha's experience uh reminds me of high school i went to a uh uh like a a 95 percent black uh, high school in south side of chicago uh so the military recruiter will come to our school very regularly and they will say straight out say look join the military is your best chance to get out you know this is your this is your best chance in life like that's that's kind of what the us is offering it's you know we we put you in a shitty position and you know the only, oh, but but here here you, we can we can give you some crumbs if you join our military and yeah. that's yeah that's a bargain they're offering yeah, it's absolutely like that. And it's, oh, by the way, if you have any issues with PTSD or any health issues and you decide to go home after it, sorry, we don't have a VA because you're a foreign country. So you'd have to like not go home if you want any treatment. And um, uh, if you die, we're really sorry, but we'll give your parents like a few thousand dollars. And like, that's not mm -hmm. worth it. Like you're fighting wars that make no sense for a country that doesn't care about you. Like, yeah, exactly. you know, like I definitely feel that like in Hawaii, we have a lot of we are like of more like most indigenous and non-white people were overrepresented and Hawaiians are also overrepresented in the US military because you know we have one of the most unlivable places. Speaking of, you know, become America, pay your mortgage, you know, it's one point two million dollars on Maui average. Uh I, I can't live on my home. Uh my I actually live, I'm in the from Kalihi Palama, which is two miles from Red Hill, where they're spilling that oil and fuel. Uh I can't even afford to live there in the toxic poison. Like it's basically it's 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 ghetto. It's a slum, but it's one million dollars even there for a tiny little. I have family that are looking for housing there. I don't know how long much longer they're gonna look for housing if the water comes out smelling like a gas station. But uh, even there, we can't live. Uh, if you want to go to the nice, it's three million dollars in Kahala. So in the nice parts wow. of Oahu, I know Shah has lived there as well. So and and so all of my family, half of my family works for the military. Sadly, because. They don't know how to survive or they've left Hawaii. They cannot afford to live in Hawaii. Uh, I left my home uh, area um, because I can't afford to. Most Hawaiians, over half of us, have been pushed out of our islands. Um, and you either have to work for the big real estate, big tourism, or big military in, in Oahu, or you are out on the street. And we were actually homeless for a period of time uh, 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 while I was working full time as a STEM and teacher and, and social services provider. That's how much they that's how much they care about teachers. They don't pay the teachers nurses the waiting staff at the hotels anything not, 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 not even close to what you need to live but maybe if you work for the military maybe they'll give you some military housing but so it's uh it's basically like yeah you if, if the us is the it's hawaii is like kind of like the, the the death star in the pacific running the world empire shooting ion cannon you know uh nuclear uh missile threats uh, you know into uh china and all across you know from the uh, 800 military bases and it's operating them from hawaii so you can you can join the stormtroopers as an illegally occupied country, uh, or you can suffer, be homeless, uh, leave your country, uh, and uh, you know. And also, they, you know, and a few other things on top of the occupation. I haven't really gone into that. Uh, maybe I'll just like briefly touch that since I'm kind of on it. But people think you know that Hawaiians again lived in huts prior to colonization, but in fact, um, this is, makes it even sadder. The United States, before we were occupied uh, in the late 1890s by the U.S. military, the USS Boston to be specific. So it's the same branch of the military poisoning us, the USS, U.S. Navy and it's USS Boston. They came to Hawaii 
in Aloha shirts and tourist clothing, the, the U.S. military, uh, the imperialists from, from the East Coast. They came in and they're looking for a nice harbor to get their share of China. That's what Mr. McKinley literally said. We need our Hong Kong because the British have Hong Kong to plunder China and all of Asia, really. But, you know, definitely China for trillions of dollars of 450 trillion stolen from the global south to the global north over the last few centuries. And the U.S. was basically saying we want to be a bigger imperialist like Britain and we need Hawaii as a unsinkable aircraft carrier. I, it's funny because uh, I'll call one. No, the U.S. Uh, Western media likes to say Taiwan is an unsinkable aircraft carrier to, for China to attack U.S. But it's, it's that, that's an ancient saying that the U.S. and the Western power has always used. Get these islands, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Hawaii, uh, you know, uh, little bases, Guam, right, to push in and project mostly naval power, but also air force power into China. And they came to Hawaii and they said, that's a nice place to set up a giant military base for our entire world empire. So we can play the British Western, uh, uh, you know, barbarian game and try to plunder as much as world's wealth as we can. Anyway, so in Hawaii, they came, they, 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 they got, they, they, they wanted Pearl Harbor and they cut a deal. Uh, we, we had actually advanced cities and I put a thread earlier. There's a whole thread and maybe Holly can post it. We had, we had, we had already the highest literacy rate in the world. The Europeans exclaimed at the Paris Exposition in 1869, where we had Bibles, textbooks, uh, 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 constitutions. We had great works of literature. We, we had a higher literacy rate. And, and the French, the British, the Americans were way behind. The French and the British and the Germans, et cetera, they were like, this island country is ahead of us in literacy. And the enlightened countries of Europe are behind it. Um, uh, 1850, actually, uh, was the point at which China was surpassed by the, the, the by the UK by the by the by, well by the the East was surpassed by the West right at that point and Hawaii had already reached the highest literacy rate um, right around that time the world's first universal healthcare system Queen's medical system was established by uh, our elected leaders here in Hawaii in uh, uh, the uh, 1859 um, that was uh, 25 years before they would even think think speaking of socialism and progressive civilization before Otto van Bismarck would think about universal health insurance so we had universal health care we had highest literacy rate. We had mass transit, railroads, uh, Ilani Palace. Our capital had lights before the White House. Uh, and all of this advanced civilization that we had. Also, we had we had we invented a subaquatic vehicles when, when Jules Verne, the science fiction writer, was writing about Captain Nemo and 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. We already invented these vehicles. We had Chinese and African full citizens when Canada had people chained up, the Asians chained up to build the West Coast and the, and the railroads in the US and Canada. And America had slaves. Uh, we already had we had racial equality, we had economic uh, advancement. I would I would argue it's so social, technologically advanced, uh, technology advanced, socialist, uh, modern econom uh, economic uh, basis that actually Sun Yat-sen would later take back as an idea to China from Hawaii. Kalakawa, our leader, that same guy who invented the subaquatic vehicle, gave the father of modern China his uh, award for excellence in grammar at Iolani School. So that's it's another little bit of the connection between. China, Hawaii, Asia, and the Pacific. And in fact, the United States destroyed our country, illegally occupied our country, aimed gunboats, like they aimed gunboats, all, like they aimed guns from their ships all over in, in Asia, in the Pacific. And they said, you are going to give up your country. They, illegal, they, they, they stole our country, our elected leader. They imprisoned our queen. They banned our language. They banned our culture. They erased our history. They said, we must obliterate history now so that nobody can know that there was an advanced non-white uh, socialist or, you know, uh, country that was working for win-win cooperation. We have to erase this and we're going to build a military base on their destroyed country. They ghettoized us. We have the highest mortality rate, 40%. We, we have the shortest life expectancy of all ethnicities, Native Hawaiians, shorter than 40% uh, wow. higher, 40 higher mortality rate than Caucasians. And we live 60 something years less than uh, uh, even other uh, minorities who are also maltreated. And we have, uh, we have, wow. we have the worst health reading outcomes, we have the worst, uh, the highest incarceration, homelessness rates when we had the most advanced country. So anyway, so I, I'm going to wrap this up real quick. So so on top of it being a horrific uh, uh, world empire headquarters, which hurts our heart, I can hear the bombings. They're practicing bombing 30 miles from where I stream, in fact. On my, my family, they can they can feel the, the, the earth shaking when they drop from their F-22s, from their Marine, uh, Army, Navy, uh, Air Force joint exercises, practicing to go massacre the Vietnamese, the Koreans, the uh, Afghani, now the Chinese, obviously, but historically, Iraq, the staged and operated and practiced from Hawaii. 
And uh, that also breaks our hearts every time we know that those bombs, while they're breaking our islands, cracking our water tables at Kohol Lave, that's already uninhabitable because the U.S. military bombed it so that it's uninhabitable so badly. They'll crack the water table. And then they're going to take that and they're going to do even worse damage by killing millions of people in, in uh, across the world. And uh, But also, the United States destroyed uh, an example of a, a, a building progressing uh, a country that was so far ahead. And I think I would argue, in fact, it's 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 kind of like they were jealous of China today. You know, they can't accept that there's a country that can operate in a win win, mutually beneficial way with internally and with internationally and between cultures. Because um, we didn't ban Chinese and Chinese didn't ban Hawaii in Hawaii. We had Hui that worked together. And the, the Americans couldn't stand that in the capitalist sugar and pineapple plantation workers were, were, were they, they, they couldn't stand that. That's part of why they wanted the U.S. to come in and get rid of these cooperative Asian and Pacific Islander uh, 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 agricultural and other businesses. They were like, we got to get rid of this universal health care and these cooperatives and this non-capitalist, non-racialized way of doing things. And that was yeah, a collusion huh? between. Anyway, uh, that's a lot. I can go on forever. I'll stop. Yeah. No, no, that was great. I mean, that's like. Uh... You 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 hit on something here. It's like how dare this non a uh, white non white country is rising above, yeah. uh, you know, doing better yeah, than right. we are. And we, I, I this reminds me before I left U.S. in 2018, I uh, took a trip to Honolulu. Um, I was surfing with my local Hawaiian friends, and we park our car uh, in you know before we went surf, we park our car on the street. And these like white settlers <laughs> in Hawaii getting super pissed that we just park our car in their neighborhood to go surf, you know. I mean, like these, like like that that really hits home because all these like lakefront, uh, seafront properties they're all bought by all these like white settlers from mainland U.S. You know, the native Hawaiians don't live there, and uh, but we for uh, we're just using the public accessible beach to to to, to surf. And, and just because we park, like, think about it. You know, my Hawaiian friends park their car on their own island and getting yelled at by these, like, so, like, <laughs> this, yeah, it's just so ridiculous. So but ridiculous. Kasha, here's the thing. Here's the thing. If we, people of color, indigenous people, they have to talk about decolonize ourselves, that is equal to white genocide. That means that like <laughs> we committing somehow genocide on white people by decolonizing ourselves. That is literally the talking point of those quote unquote leftists. So what's your idea about this? I want to hear the thoughts of Yon too, because like this also re uh, like a little bit relate to the uh, anti American kind of faction in South Korean right now. And yeah, I want to, to, to learn more about it. Very fascinating. Uh, so there's obviously anti-American sentiment here. Back in the early 2000s, there was an incident where a US tank ran over two school schoolgirls, murdering them in just cold sight. And you know, these incidents keep happening, reoccurring. Uh, something I wanted to touch on was military prostitution in Korea. So, oh, yes. So, obviously, prostitution has been banned here since 1948. However, the South Korean economy and the U.S.-South Korean alliance basically dependent was dependent on military prostitution and the subjugation of women to emerge from the devastation of the Korean War. So by 1958, there were 300,000 prostitutes in Korea. By 1965, there 85% uh, of US soldiers reported to have been with a prostitute. And the line from the DMZ to downtown Seoul was called GI Heaven. And the Itaewon neighborhood was called Hucker Hill. So and obviously, there were many crimes committed by the U.S. soldiers. There was one incident where a Korean prostitute was brutally murdered in 1992. Her name was Yoon Gum Yi. She was murdered by a U.S. soldier called Kenneth Merkley. He 
was in jail for about 15 years and was deported back to the U.S. 15 years for brutally murdering a Korean woman. I mean, you know, these Americans, they come here illegally, invade our country, commit horrific crimes, and basically leave with like a slap on the wrist. <laughs> yeah. Totally understand you because Vietnam, the south of Vietnam under U.S. occupation in the 60s and 70s was also the biggest brothel in Indochina at that time. It was um, my uh, group, non La Collective, got an article talk about the prostitution, prostitution under the colonialism and imperialism. So generally speaking, compared to the population at that time, the number of women and girls, little girls, who were forced to work on that industry was huge on the population like that. And it was, we even, they, they even called Saigon, aka Ho Chi Minh City at that time, the pearl of the Far East, Hòn Ngoc Viễn Đông. And by the pearl, they meant like, it was like, you know, the city foods of drugs and prostitutes and all kind of, you know, like forced labor or something like that. And it was really, really, really ugly part of the history. And this is literally the thing that the U.S. always brought with themselves when they occupy and, you know, invade any other country. And it is really, I mean, I don't yeah. have any words to describe it. U.S. did the U.S. military did this wherever it goes. There was actually a 1967 December 22nd issue of the Times where they did a special on Christmas called Christmas in Vietnam. It's actually, if you read it, it's, it's full page of U.S. military sex tourism in Southeast Asia. They have like. Uh, you know, they talk about how great it was a military serviceman can take time off and go take R&R &R in Vietnam, you know, where they can hang out with, uh, you know, bikini clad Vietnamese girl. They can go to uh, Taiwan, go to Thailand. And this is, uh, and in, in, you know, it's not limited to Vietnam or, 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 or South Korea either. In Taiwan, the, the, at the time, the KMT regime that was supported by U.S. government actually um, sponsor a sex tourism industry catering to GI, you know, to, from, to, from, um, from 1965 to 1970, during the time of Vietnam War, 200,000 GI visited Taiwan. And, and there, there was an infamous picture they, they uh, posted in the Times magazine, right? It's, it says 20 minutes by taxi from Taipei is Beitou, a hot software spa with 75 hotels among which one of the most re, uh, rewarding is a literary in. Not every GI is inclined to tear himself away from pleasure of Taipei to seek it out. But those who like Corporal Alan Bailey, 21 year old, a Marine MP from Cincinnati has never regretted decision. A company with that uh, caption is this American GI in the hot tub with two women naked. And, and this is like, this is openly encouraged in the Times magazine, you know, mainstream U.S. Yeah. magazine. This is this is this is a or, or and some some people did point out that Alan Charles Bailey was one of the killed in action in Vietnam. So I guess you know he got what he deserved. So, but this is you know this is a legacy of U.S. military all all over Asia and continues today. Yeah, in Japan, Philippines, South Korea, Thailand, Vietnam. And you know what? This is the fact that like um, the age of Vietnamese prostitutes for U.S. soldiers started from six. Oh. Yeah, I heard that. Wasn't it? Isn't it Korea that it was like 25% of the entire population were um, that was the primitive accumulation to begin their economy? Um, I believe it was on another panel. Uh, it, but it, it was that and also, uh, you know, the South uh, South Korean government sending uh, basically mercenaries to to Vietnam to fight for the Americans. And and this the and on top of that, they the American media uses that to dehumanize Asian women like the 
the f- infamous scene in the Full Metal Jacket. You know, they had that uh, Vietnamese uh, sex worker saying, "Oh, me not love you long time," and that became kind of the butt of the joke to you know in, in America to to kind of de- to to sexualize every Asian woman as a sex object. You know, as, as some somebody yeah. to be possess and own for this for the white desire. I mean, this is really disgusting stuff. I am the victim of that. Even to this day, male American male sexualize me and treat me as sex object. So like, I am a Vietnamese woman born living in Vietnam. I have my channel. I run my channel for over three years already, and I am totally capable of speaking my own thought. But they still treat me as re- literally a sexual object, and it is really disgusting. And the thing is that like, I don't even give a shit if those people just call themselves like, just admit they are like Nazi or fascists or right wingers, but they call themselves leftists. That is a disgusting part about this. Those freaking call themselves leftists, supposed to care about women, people of color, indigenous people, but like they treat me exactly like a bunch of Nazis, cheetahs. What's the difference? I think any leftist from West needs to put the double quote around it unless proven otherwise. That's my quote, rule. Quote, leftist. <laughs> yes, that's my rule. <laughs> if you are from the West, you are leftist unless you prove your uh, actual positions. <laughs> Yeah, um, I just wanted to quickly. I want to say, uh, uh, on, uh, just just on a topic of the tourism, you know, because that's why we didn't, I didn't really touch on it too much. But uh, I just posted a little thread about specifically tourism, and and also links, uh, you know, Asia and Pacific, Hong Kong and Hawaii, which both shared uh, uh, a history of colonial occupation, uh, ghettoization of the people, uh, as I was talking about uh, before I uh, finished last time, um, and the wealthy whites enjoyed paradise uh, as a beautiful resort. Uh, used as used both Hong Kong and Hawaii to continue pillaging China uh, as a, as an imperialist outpost, as well as a, a as a vacation destination, Waikiki, of course, and etc. Uh, uh, and there's an ad actually in that thread. There's a picture of see Hong Kong, the Riviera of the Orient, and there's two Asian uh, two two Chinese people carrying a, a white guy uh, up a hill on on you know famously this is a thing that happened where the where the colonizers showed up carrying the white rich man on the back of the two uh, Hong Kong uh, people. Um, you know, with all the sh- all the naval ships in the harbor and the beautiful scenery, nice, 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 beautiful uh, greenery and tropical climate for you to enjoy your vacation. And I'm um, similar to Waikiki and Hawaii. Uh, there's ads by Dole who uh, participated in the illegal overthrow. Uh, uh, Dole, who was a descendant of the uh, the the um, he was a relative of of Sanford Bob Dole and Sanford Dole, who collaborated um, to uh, as pineapple barons. Um, who also were the kind of people who operated, for example, the United Fruit Company in the Central South America. Uh, Dole uh, had an ad that was uh, after the overthrow that said, the perfect servant lives in Honolulu. Come to Hawaii, enjoy your beautiful pineapples um, and get the perfect servant, the perfect coolie, the perfect, uh, uh, basically everything short of slave. And also that also means like the perfect people that will serve you and dance the perfect hula. In fact, hula, you know, uh, not to say that you, it's not to say that you can't visit Hawaii, but the, but the way that the, the tourism industry is set up, it, uh, we don't benefit most of the revenue from the vacation uh, uh, visitors. The, 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 the to this day, um, coming into the airport and going to Waikiki and the Turtle Bay Resort and and you know having a great time on the beach, um, the profits from those corporations like uh, Donald Trump owns the Ritz, Goldman Sachs, huge Wall Street bank owns Turtle Bay, Hyatt. Uh, Mitt Romney uh, uh, and the Latter Day Saints, they own Marriott, that operates huge numbers of hotels. Now that the most of the revenue, the wages are terrible. It's like minimum wage jobs, uh, very abusive, um, uh, versus in terms of economically abusive, not paying enough to live, and also uh, there's a lot of uh, sexual abuse and other uh, types of abuse in these situations, and um, and we're not seeing the revenue from that, you know, and uh, and, and so Hong Kong and Hawaii uh, share that uh, history. Uh, as well with the rest of Asia, like we're talking about. And that, that include a lot of, um, you know, the ads are similar. Come to Hawaii and have your exotic, beautiful hula girl, you know, and you can put one on your dashboard, you know, in your car. And um, and that that's 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 been a problem in Hawaii as well for a long time. So, um, and uh, yeah, so people don't really think about it. Like, oh, I love Hawaii. I love it so much. And we, we would love to share, like, to, you know, I think of uh, just just is kind of not not maybe we'll open this topic more later, but Urumqi is a place 
that is actually one of the Jinshan is one of the world's largest tourist destinations. Uh, it's a part of China. But you know, I'm watching people from there. Um, I recall you shared a video of uh, 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 um, I is a Uyghur vlogger, but it was talking about how um, this. You know, um, I'm glad that the tourism and the economic benefits of people like like enjoying our culture, seeing our dances, enjoying our food has benefited us as well as people who are gaining from this tourism. But in Hawaii, unfortunately, uh, we're not seeing, number one, our hula is desecrated. Our language is not allowed to be spoken for a long time. Uh, we're not benefiting insane, yes. from our, like we could have tourism in a healthy way, but the way that America and the West and capitalism is doing it is they're doing kind of fake versions of our dances. They're not allowing us to control and benefit. Like I said, we're the, we're the poorest, worst demographic across the board in all, all, all the, you know, health, economics, uh, housing. So we're not seeing the benefit from that tourism because of the unequal racialized capitalism and the imperialism. And so, um, and uh, so that's another thing because people say, Silver Spook, you should support America in fighting China. You should support. And I'm like, you, you want me to, you know, they say, Silver Spook, are you a genocide denier? Because you said this about, you didn't say China is the worst thing since, uh, you know, Satan. And I'm like, well, as an ethnic minority of this country that you, you, you're saying you care about the ethnic minorities over there. Your country is treating me and my family now and historically horribly to this moment. And, uh, you know, actually, I actually know some of the people there. I, I like learned a Uyghur song, in fact, so I was like, I, they do a lot of dancing like us. And I said, you know, they actually seem to be treated a lot better from everything that I can gather. And uh, uh, it, actually, if you would stop occupying us, maybe we would be doing better because we could join, you know, if we could join the Silk Road and win win cooperation because we didn't have a freaking Death Star crushing us poisoning us maybe that would help ethnic minorities you know these people are often from the sometimes left and university of the west right and they're doing land acknowledgements oh we're on the stolen land of the indigenous people of you know the the, the lakota people where i'm doing my conference oh we're on we, we are we are we're doing land acknowledgements for indigenous people right but when it comes you know but i mean how much do you really care if you are still hurting this indigenous person by lying and pushing out this war propaganda that's killing us. You know what I'm saying? Anyway. A, a lot of the U.S. left yeah, is, thank you so much. For, yeah. is, is performance. It's like all these, it, it's very performative. You know, they, 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 oh, I acknowledge land back, but what are you doing about it? You know, are you, are you actually going out and organizing protests that you, you you're actually, uh, you know, criticizing the U, U.S. Uh, media coverage? No, you, you're just saying this to make yourself, oh, I am woke. You know, I, I'm one of the better person. And the, 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 the thing about, uh, you know, Hong Kong reference you, you, you mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of the Westerners, when I realized this, when a lot of Westerners are protesting, they're saying the freedom is being taken away from Hong Kong. They're talking about that disappearing golden age when they're at the top of the racial hierarchy, they're being the master. You know, nobody, none of these people complain when Hong Kong was a British colony, when that, that ads, you know, that you talk about was actually a reality, was a fact of life. And it's, 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 yeah. it's, it's yeah, I don't know what to say. <sighs> yeah, talk about decolonization. I want to read this comment real quick. Uh, any Western, any white Western leftists, Equating decolonization to white genocide should really be kept out of the spaces and uh, kept out of our spaces and movement. Sorry, that's a gate that needs to be kept. Yes, um, uh, the thing is that like uh, Sha, I uh, because you have to uh, leave real quick, so I want to hear your thought oh, about yeah. yes, decolonization of our people. What do you think about this? Decolonization and indigenization go hand in hand. You cannot decolonize without indigenizing because once you remove everything, if you haven't indigenized the people who remain, the problem is still there. I mean, we have our sovereignty. We also have people who had never, we didn't have cash economy. We didn't have scarcity mentality, all these things that people talk about. These have negatively impacted our culture, our customs, our people. We have real estate agents who are dying to like sell us out who are our own people we have leadership political leadership we have traditional leadership who are just dying to sell us out they do it all the time and that's if you decolonize without indigenizing that is what happens and the two go hand in hand mm. and so 
that's I mean that's part of the work that I do outside of here is is talking about how the two go hand in hand how solidarity is rooted in building relationships with people and caring about them not transactional relationships I yes I acknowledge what Papa Mao did in terms of assisting the Hawaiian people with navigation don't be nice to us because of things like that be nice to us because we're human beings and I care about you and I want you to do well. I want you to care about me and my people so that we can do well. The reason it's called the global majority is there's more of us than there are of them. And once we can connect in that way versus transactional relationships, we can win. And so. Exactly. I've been saying that so many times, like just actually white people just make up about 15 to 20 percent of the world population. Like we don't need them. So like if if they join us, that's for their own benefits. And if they not join us, we're going to overthrow them anyway, right? It works. <laughs> we, we've got relationships um, yeah, to build it, it, and meals to have with each other and time exactly. to spend together once this pandemic thing passes. Yeah. Uh, the, it's great to have you here, Sha. If you have to leave, just leave whenever you can. All um, right. Thank you so much for inviting me. You back. Thanks so much. Yeah, I hope that I can have you Thanks. back in the future. Absolutely. It's so great to talk Thanks. to you. Bye. I'm going to be tuning in while getting ready. Take <laughs> Thank you, Shah. So, I mean, uh, Yaron, I, what do you think about this, the decolonization and how white leftists are trying so hard to equate it as white genocide? Um, so with decolonization, um, something that i find deeply important to me we are we like we are a maori we make up a nation that uh we had a declaration of independence um and then we had a treaty that then i guess solidified that inf that uh declaration of independence even further um uh, but ever since uh, 1840 um the settler government has just refused to uh, follow this treaty, they will always talk about these. These um, they will always talk about treaty principles, um, but they never they never clarify what they mean by that. Um, and another problem as well for us is there's technically two different versions of the treaty that we have. There's the Te Tiriti, which is the one that I mainly refer to, which is the Maori language one, which was the one that was written first. And then there was an English translation that was written after, but they actually say quite different things on them. Um, and I think that the settlers relied on the fact that they said two different things. Um, so, yeah, for for Māori here, uh, decolonization is like deeply important, and um, and, and, I, and I think as well. Uh, there's there's this feeling of uh, by by uh, you know by I guess uh, white people we say Pākehā here, but uh, Pākehā they have this tendency where they fear that um, that giving anything back to us means that something is taken from them. Um, when mm. when it's just like no, we 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 don't really intend to kick you out. You can stay here if you want. But it's just you, 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 you can't keep going on like this. You can't keep, keep you, you kind of keep pretending that you, you are the one in charge here, because this this place doesn't belong to you. Um, it's our guest, and we welcome that. Yeah, it's like you, 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 you are here as 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 guests, and we treat our guests very well, very very well. Um, so, so it's like stick around and 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 uh, you'll have a good time. Yeah. I think there's a lot of guilty conscience at play. Oh, here that, definitely, you know, yeah. Because they 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 keep assuming once they give up power, uh, the indigenous people are gonna do to them what they have done. To what the they did to us. People. Yes, yeah, they, exactly. It's exactly. like it's that projection. Yeah, we're gonna cheat them at, exactly as they cheated us. So they scared. That's, that's where that talk about why genocide come from. It's pure projection. It's, <laughs> they're just going to assume, oh, okay, shit. If we give up power, we're, oh my God, they're going to take revenge. They're going to do exactly what we have done to their ancestors, to us. It's like, 
no the, what we're asking is equality you know everybody just treat us human beings yeah exactly and, and we don't want to treat you as you treated us we are not as barbaric as you okay yeah uh, like the like uh, another thing as well is is like historically we have been the ones holding up the settlers until they you know managed to get enough weapons and then turned on us um but for a very long time i think even well into the 1900s uh quite a lot of um like pieces of maori land that still remained were feeding uh, a lot of the settler population because they didn't know how to farm this land because it was so foreign to them and over the years they've uh, managed to roll over everything and you know replace it with their monoculture and things like that um and so as well as and so again like uh because of this uh, monoculture and different agricultural things this land is kind of slowly uh crumbling underneath us because uh they don't they, they don't know how to look after this place and um like like our biggest export is uh meat and dairy um but like those are our main exports we feed we feed multiple countries uh and like only a tiny sliver of what we produce is actually remains here so we're doing we're going above and beyond and it's and it's kind of destroying here it's kind of destroying our home really and they they kind of just ignore it and be like oh well we're doing you know carbon offset tax or you know some shit like that it's just like that that well that doesn't really do anything yeah. we had we had methods to look after yeah. this place and you're not letting us do them <laughs> yeah exactly. unfortunately that's, the, thing that's... Like the first step yeah yeah Okay. Now, unfortunately, that's uh, you know that's the effect of capitalism. It's it's commodify commodify everything. You know, commodify culture, commodify indigenous culture, commodify natural resources. Um, everything turns into yes, women. Everything become commodity and can be extracted, can be exported, can be exploited, and damn the consequences because the profit is the overwhelming drive. You know, the the next quarter uh the, the the next quarter earning report that's that's all everybody care about about the stock price of the company uh you know who cares if if like 50 years they, they destroy the land all only thing they care about is the short-term gain and that is a feature of the capitalism capitalist society yes um the thing is that like uh as i said like many times before in different streams so like people talking about land back white leftists quote quote talk about land back as like you know like i don't even know they why they attack it but anyway to us i i mean like to me land back it's just like a really first step of decolonization because like how can you decolonize yourself without taking your land back and land back is not about taking revenge on white people or something it just want to you know to gain our, you know, like the, the, the respect and, 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 and to get to be, we to become like the real owner of the land so we can, you know, and owner it, in a sense of like of, the, of respect, not owner as capitalist sense. Oh my gosh, I need to get this very clear because like we don't believe in the private ownership of land. Even in Vietnam right now, all land is like, you, you know, like, you know, what do you call it? I suddenly forgot the word, like the whole, people of vietnam own the land is a collective okay. ownership yeah yes and that is how we treat our land okay that is how we treat our land and white people they can't wrap their head around this idea and i want to see what book why don't you uh, uh explain luna, the concept luna, of aina I'm sorry but oh, luna bill hayden said you are a landlord you know? <laughs> <laughs> Shit! God damn it, Bill Hayden destroyed me, huh? Oh, he has a degree from a fancy university <laughs> in the West. You gotta watch out. I own 500 square meter of rice farm. Like, dude, I don't even own it, like, personally. I just own the rice to cultivate that land. Because in Vietnam, the land ownership is collective ownership. But anyway, of course, a white expert on Vietnam and China must know more about me, really, right? A little Vietnamese born and living in Vietnam all my life. 
But anyway, so yeah, I, I want you to see this book to explain the concept of Aina. Oh, oh okay. yeah, is that one? What were you talking? I was just gonna say, don't, uh, don't. <laughs> when um, they had they had accused you of uh, keeping your auntie on the land as a serf. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they're gonna see that on New York Times tomorrow. Luna Oi forced labor. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh man. Um, anyways, uh, uh, wait. Yeah, and I know. I'm sure we'll touch on that. But yeah, there's so many. Uh, but yeah, I, I know. Yeah. For for those who don't know, uh, like I said, uh, I am Native Hawaiian. By the way, this is uh, where's my? Oh yeah, this is the this is not Kanaka. This is not the official flag of the country of Hawaii. This is the this is the official flag. By the way, so um. It has a Union Jack in it um, because uh, yeah, look at that. Right, right fragility, basically. Or if you if you didn't have a, 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 we had to be a legion to the British, otherwise they would have fully colonized us, just taking everything. So um, on top of it, we had to prove that we could we could read better and we had more technological advancements. We also had to put, you know, their 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 symbol inside our flag, otherwise they would just uh, gunboat destroy us and colonize us. So anyway, but that's part of how we remain independent and neutral. We're the third country in the world to be neutral, by the way. Uh, like Vietnam is today. Uh, Switzerland was the first. Um, but Aina. So what is Aina? Aina is a concept in Hawaii, uh, in the in the you know the, the language of the Kanaka Maoli. That's what we refer to ourselves as the Kanaka Maoli. Uh, and it, it's um, and also the Hawaiian language is uh, in the Austronesian language family. So a lot of similar words with our relative uh, ya Yaron in uh, in, in Aotearoa or New Zealand, uh, like like Maori and Maoli. You know, um, depending on who is transcribing the language, the Calvinist missionaries. In Hawaii, um, it had K's and L's, and in other, the, in other places, uh, I've even seen French transcriptions of Hawaii and uh, of Hawaiian language, and they have T's and R's. But so um, the languages are very, very similar. And we um, Aina is a word in a, a language that means um, it's it's a, it means it's our conception of land, right? So um, is that which feeds, that which sustains, um, and it means um, something very different from like what real estate, private property. Uh, or land, land as a landlord. You know, land is a thing to be bought and sold, to be traded uh, under feudalism, to be owned and operated by a lord, feudal lord. It's funny because they want to talk like that you got better from feudalism in the West, but why do you keep the word landlord in there? I, you might want to change that word out someday, Westerners. Um, but anyways, exactly. so, you know, I mean, you putting the feudalism right in there. But so, so Hawaiians had a different conception of control and operation for the benefit of, you know, a, a hereditary aristocracy with an oligarchy behind it. I would argue that that's, that hasn't changed for a long, many centuries in the Western re world. But in Hawaii, I know was that which feeds, that which sustains. You, you cannot control uh, land in that way. Um, like Luna is saying, we don't, we don't have ownership of land for a private benefit um, in Hawaii. The ali'i, that's the word that means like, it doesn't mean king, it doesn't mean chief, it doesn't mean president, it doesn't mean CEO, it doesn't mean slave master. It means more something closer to steward Ali were the leaders, something kind of like the it's not the same, but something kind of like the way that the I, as I studied it, the way that the Mandarin system operates, those people that are best at maintaining and operating and managing because of their merit, right? In in in, in managing, in growing, they're put in charge because they're competent in that. Kahuna is the word sometimes the expert in a particular field, but Ali were like the 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 people who would oversee this. The makai nana is a word for the, the common common people, but it doesn't mean commoners in a European feudal or capitalist uh, or slavery sense. It common the makai nana are the eyes. Makai is the gate, uh, 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 and ai nana is the, the the eyes and the soul of the land. They are not less important than the ali, which is very important because people when the, when you translate it, in, oh, there's a king and these are the commoners. Um, the, the 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 people were not it was not allowed to be to, you not you were not able to treat maltreat the common people uh in Hawaii in Hawaiian culture. I mean not to say that we were perfect, we we're like angels or something, but we we had the longest life expectancies, we had very little food shortages, we had two hour to three hour work days and we spent the rest of the time surfing and associating with our family. A luau is actually a living, I would argue it's a living socialist uh, practice where you come together from the benefits of the land, right? So the the so the 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 the, 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 lao lao, the pork the fish, whatever we've harvested with a very advanced ecological regenerative system that doesn't damage the land like uh, uh, Yaron was alluding to. We also had her, it's called the Ahu Pua'a system from the mountains to the sea, land divisions um, that were tended to and uh, kept kept the land providing with very minimal work uh, per, per hour. We actually work more for less nowadays, despite all the advances of technology. Part of that's because of capitalism, et cetera. But part of it is just, they're just in a uh, not, um, 
land management for the benefit of a, again a minority tiny sliver of the population but hawaiians didn't have that so under the under the aina uh, uh, uh conception um the land was used and it benefited all the people um and the, the individuals who were in charge you know it were, were were put there by the people and there are ways like if you were not there's a story of the flying kalo where an ali who is not carrying out their their kuleana their responsibilities to the people could be could you could either you could you didn't have like votes like a representative of democracy but you could leave an unjust ali who is hoarding too much it's a story of ali who kept too much for himself like i don't know bill gates or i don't know king louis or i don't know any feudal mm -hmm. slavery capitalist ceo or the techno king elon they kept too much for themselves and they didn't give it away that person was could be either you could leave and then you could get other ali to come in and uh at the end of the story basically other ali come in and they reprimand the one who is trying to hoard for himself uh the produce the labor value in in a, in a western marxist sense the labor value that's being hoarded that that was unacceptable and you but the thing is we had a system that was already basically communistic right uh the way a lot of indigenous people mm -hmm. systems are right and then and then the person who's trying to be a capitalist one out of 99 uh, leaders trying to be a ceo or a master would would be uh brought back into a collective reality by the rest of the society that's actually what that the lesson of that, that, that it's a myth of the flying hollow anyway so so that's what aina kind of means and so we talk about land back you know like i said the silver spook hui which is another word um that also ties asia pacific together uh I learned from Luna, it's a Hui, yeah. it's a Hawaiian, Chinese, Vietnamese, and Maori word that doesn't mean exactly yes, the same thing. It's very interesting. But it's very similar. And in fact, the, the Hui, so the, the, I was talking about the Asian and Hawaiian uh, Hui, the uh, Kalakaua, who brought in uh, Chinese uh, farmers, including Sun Yat Sen, again, the father of modern China. His older brother, Sun Mei, was a, was a, was a rice farmer that was, that was invited in, which is not settler colonialism. If you're coming in, that's very important. I want to point this out because people go, oh, well, the Chinese are colonizing everyone else. So we should there. You know, if you come in and you live in cooperation with the people, if you're invited in, like some countries, for example, to get out military bases, that it's usually the U.S., right? If you're invited in and you are you are cooperating and you are operating by the local, uh, you, you're not there like Hawaii. That's why the, 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 the African and Chinese citizens of Hawaii, um, as long as you're not there to undo their country and you're going to win, win, cooperate. And you're not going to ban. I mean, you're not going to harm our language. You're not going to exploit our people. You could you could exist there. And some of the some you know and 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 and, and then it's a mutually beneficial thing. In fact, the manapua is a food you can find in Hawaii. Um, that goes. It's it's a Hawaiian word that means the tasty pork thing. But it was a, it's a Chinese pork bun. It's ancient. It's like from the 1800s. It's a Chinese pork bun, but using like local Hawaiian ingredients with a Hawaiian name. And so that's one example of these things. And another one is is in the Hui system, is because this word that separates Hawaii and China by th we're, we're separated by thousands of years and thousands of miles, right? But it's it's interesting that Shaokang Shahui, right, which means co common moderate prosperity, right, which is something that the CPC is currently pursuing. Uh, Lahui is the word that means the nation, all of the people coming together, and uh, and Hui still means uh, a cooperative, and but not only economic, it not mean not only a business cooperative, it can also mean a, a cooperative ho housing situation like what we have here. At here on the Big Island, and also it can mean political action, like Sing Chang Hui or Tong Ming Hui, which are two revolutionary parties founded, in fact, from Hawaii. Tong Ming Kui, yeah. Yeah, Tong Ming Kui, right? And 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 that were yeah. that were launched at China based on using Hawaii as a model for technologically advanced socialist, anti-imperialist uh, 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 China. And but that's also a Hui. It's a political. Anyway, that, I just find it really interesting that that word also unites the. Uh, 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 it, it means something beyond just you know because nowadays we talk about worker cooperatives, which are important, but this actually transcends. Um, there's a there's a deep indigenous um, knowledge and way of operating. That's part of the thing that gets lost in translation. That's part of why people attack Luna because they can't understand this conception of ownership that isn't benefiting. You know, they can only go well. You somebody has to be exploiting someone, otherwise. That, that, that it's not possible they can't believe it's possible and anyway i'll stop talking yeah they can't uh it's very interesting because like i also study chinese so like the word like hui in in how in hawaii and also like there's a hui in chinese and then the word hoi in vietnamese exactly the same word and we have so many hoi such as like you know the 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 farmers way and then the women's way and then students way it's like 
everywhere in Vietnam, and it just means that everybody join in you know, a cooperative like that. And yeah, yeah, very interesting to see our culture like share the same like yeah. It, it means like it means co- it means a congregation, a collective. Yeah, it's it's. In mm. um in, in Tereo Maori, yeah, the um words uh when hui for us usually refers to like a like a, a large gathering or meeting of people, usually for the sake of work. So it is a the concept is of working together, um, but uh, for cooperatives specifically, we use the word ohu. Um, mm. And as well, uh, with Olelo Hawaii, um, the, the word aina in our language is uh, whenua. And um, whenua. That, that word, uh, I don't know if, I don't know if it means the same thing uh, in, in Hawaii, but um, but for us, it it's as well as using it to describe land. It also describes um, a placenta, and there's kind of a link there in the way that we see land as well as you know, because the placenta is sort of the thing that nourishes the baby as it is developing. We call it in Dutch and Vietnamese, and it means like literally means like the motherland. Because we treat our land as our mother, and we all you don't own like as a Hawaiian said like you don't own your mother, okay? You share yeah. your mother, and you love your mother, and you protect your mother. You don't privately own your mother, okay? Yep. The thing is, I like oh, but I want to bring it a little bit. Like a lot of people, white leftists talking about uh, land bike and decolonization, as in like like imagination that never ever happened or something so like you made up a bunch of ridiculous and weird like results or outcomes out of it if you did like dude vietnam did it vietnam did it twice like first and we kicked the colonialist french out of vietnam in 1954 like like and the people talking about what about other innocent white people who have their own family they are like what French colonialists been living in Vietnam for more than a hundred of years. Okay, you they brought their families here and they had their children here. And like they had their own life. But like, yes, we did kick them out. We did decolonize ourselves. We did take our land back. Is Vietnam an ethno state right now? Does Vietnam right now ban all French like tourists going to Vietnam right now? Like, no, it's like they actually it never happened, but it did happen right here in Vietnam. And the thing is that like we didn't even really need to kick off them out. Just like just they just heard about it. So like, oh Vietnamese people are rising up and they immediately like that pack pack everything up and jump onto their boats and their crews and go back to their homeland. We didn't even really need to, to do any genocide quote unquote on them. They just scared. They just they got scared and they just all left. And and in 1975, we did it again with American. So the thing is that, like, talking about the concept of land bike and decolonization as uh, something that only happened in people's imagination is absurd. Those people, they, they clearly, I don't know that they don't know about it, they don't care, or because the fact is uncomfortable to them, so they never really consider it. But Vietnam did take our land back. We did decolonize ourselves and is Vietnam an ethno state right now, and that's just it. Uh, that's really a, like an argument that, that, against the white genocide bullshit. Yeah. That's one thing about the Western left. They, you know, they have all these examples of successful socialist national liberation movement in the third world nations, you know. But but they 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 look down upon them. They're like, oh no, these are Vietnam, China. Uh, Cuba, these are authoritarian regimes. You know, we we don't want that. <laughs> Instead, what do you, what are you gonna have then? You have nothing. You have you you know you instead of learning from a successful example of revolution, you you cast your disdain upon them. What you have left is whatever CIA is telling you that you can have. What 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 do you have left? You 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 need a successful model. Right, but by right now, the I think a lot of the so-called "quote unquote" left because there there are genuine leftists in the West, but 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 a lot of yes, the "quote unquote" "quote unquote" left, they are just 
they're just doing it because maybe it's cool, you know, like like Obama in college trying to impress girls. <laughs> but yeah. Anyways, yeah, we totally. I, I just I just wanted to bring uh, Jan back in, but um, uh, did, and this I don't know this I don't know if you're gonna like this question, but um, so so Jan Jan B. Park has said that it's in in North Korea it's illegal to love your mother. Um, I don't... <laughs> what what? You know, I've seen so many crazy things coming out of her channel. Uh, there was this one video saying Kim Jong Un ran out of virgins. <laughs> What? Yeah, yeah, I saw that too. <laughs> I mean, what the? I mean, it's not. She's a, have... She's obviously just you know a puppet for conservatives. She's getting paid. Who knows how much money to say all this, this bullshit about the DPRK? I mean, she should be using her. Platform. Oh, she admitted it. Some somehow one of her uh, one of her manager admitted that she got from like twelve point five thousand dollars for each of her speech. I mean, a lot wow. of defectors from the north get paid so much money from the South Korean from the South Korean government to say all this stuff, and obviously, a lot of the defectors are women because that says a lot about human trafficking right um yeah 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 it just you know i, I was just you know if you want to like, talk about because um i were watching it was one of the anti-imperial panels it was kj no was uh, uh talking about the the difference between north korea and south korea a lot of things that people think about north korea uh oh it's people are all starving people are uh they're, they're, or you know and historically there were this huge genocide uh no no uh political you can't have political opinions you know um but actually these are things that actually the south regi regime the southern u.s back regime have done and that, that in fact a lot of squid game is like based on historical events um uh that have taken place in korea um and uh i, I was just like you know because that's one thing like so many people they don't even realize how much you just hear north korea and you go oh that's that the most horrible place on earth. That's the most abusive, terrible regime in the world. And um, I mean, I don't know if you just want to like, uh, I know it's a lot of lies to debunk, but you know, just talk about what people think about what's wrong about South and North Korea. The thing Korea. is that John, like we all have somebody like that to to deal with in our life because Vietnam, because like, even like Korea, you have like Park on me. In Vietnam, we have ending O. Literally <laughs> fascist. <laughs> Oh, God. Oh, one thing I wanted to say was about 70% of more than 31,000 defectors who made it to South Korea are women. Now, oh. this obviously is because of the human tra human human sex trafficking, tra the global tra sex trade having a big in impact on this. And there had the figure in recent years reaching about 80 percent from 2014 to 2016 and 85 percent in 2021 so that number is just going up because of human trafficking and the global sex trade and obviously when these North, when these north korean defectors come to south korea they are obviously not allowed to go back. There has been one incident where the NSA uh, prevented Kim Yon, who was a defector from North Korea, who was prevented from seeing her family, her husband, her kids, her parents, because of the NSA. Mm. Because she was uh, still patriotic for the DPRK. And she was... She was brought here like, in. Um, I'm sorry. It's, yeah, yeah. Keep, uh, just, yeah, keep, keep talking if you haven't finished your point yet. Yeah. She was brought to the South Korea in 2011 due to a human trafficker, and was not allowed to go back because of the NSA. Wow. Wow. The, the one thing we a lot of people in the West they don't realize any. A lot, almost like 99% of the news they hear from North, 
uh, coming that he hear about North Korea is is very carefully curated news coming from South Korean and American intelligence agencies. And you know, for people who travel to actually travel to North Korea, they will see a totally different picture. And uh, you know, before the pandemic, that was possible. And 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 people don't and like people in U.S. particularly, they use South Korea North Korea contrast as justification for the U.S. hegemony. Say, hey, look, we did good by South Korea. Look, you know, look, South Korea today is a vibrant democracy. Blah blah blah. And look at North Korean people are starving. But they don't actually in history. North Koreans, North Korea actually was doing comparatively better than South Korea in the 1960s, and even in 1970s, it's the South South Korea and North Korea were neck to neck uh, in terms of development in the 1970s, and it's only in the 1980s South Korea started pulling ahead. So it all depending on your time frame of reference, right? I mean, like uh, you, you, we don't know. North Korea actually, uh, you know, suffer a lot because the collapse of Soviet Union. Uh, because it's, North Korea used to be part Function. of the Eastern Bloc, yeah, Eastern Bloc trading system, and and because of the, the the collapse of Soviet Union uh, and and loss of access to fuels, that caused a lot of hardship in the early '90s. But we, if that's your only reference of North Korea, I mean, time. History do not stand still. We are not at the end of history, folks. De de no, regardless what <laughs> Fukuyama says, you know, twenty years from now, ten years from now, we look back, it might be different. Situation might be different. Uh, you know, people are making history constantly on the ground. It look, look, I mean, like people may make the same argument about China, about Vietnam. You know, back in nineteen eighties or back in back in nineteen nineties. Say, oh look, you know, now as the, the communists took over, the economy is not good compared to this and that. But you know, right now, economy in China and Vietnam are booming. You know, because people are investing exactly. into their lives, they're, they're 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 building their own country. So times, you know, we are we cannot look at history as a teleological because Americans look at the history as like this linear progression. The end of it is, you know, you've been American, everybody, everybody <laughs> being American. But that that's not how it works. So I, I just want to put that out there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the over... thing is that like, I'm uh, just uh, saying like um, the, in, in, in the 50s, the history of Vietnam and Korea was very similar. So like Vietnamese people to this day still look at the situation in North and South Korea as a big lesson to Vietnamese people. I mean, like, it's funny that she's like, you know, there are two biggest like arguments about this. Like there are the a faction of Vietnamese people who are like, you know, liberals, neoliberals, bootlickers, look at South Korea and saying like, oh, if uh, Vietnam never win the Vietnam War, Vietnam, the so South Vietnam would be like South Korea right now, so rich, blah, blah, blah. But another big affection coming from the communists of Vietnam saying like, dude, just look at what's been going on in North and South Korea. Like, we don't want our country to be like that. So the thing is that like, looking at the situation of North and South Korea right now, as I said, like it teaches us a lot of lessons of like how to protect and how to run our country, and um, like uh, a few. Oh, actually, like I, I, I want to ask you on a little bit about the situation of like you know of South Korea right now about like you know the people's life, the economy, and what do you think about the future of South Korea? Yeah, so due to the occupation in South Korea, there were obviously a lot of military dictatorships and massacres that occurred because obviously Korea is under the operational control of the U.S. military. So, you know, back in Gwangju in the 80s, many student protesters were killed on the streets by cops and the South Korean military. That obviously led to the June Democratic Uprising in 1987, which 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 was triggered by the death of a so that uh, SNU student named Park Jong Chol. Uh, 
And obviously, just because Chunduan was eventually overthrown and democratic reforms were implemented in 1988 does not mean mass censorship and police brutality suddenly ended in South Korea. It is not a flourishing democracy like many liberals like to peddle around. Uh, back in 2014, the Unified Progressive Party, which was advocating for uh, reunification, and the end of the U.S. occupation was banned under the Park administration. And since then, there has not been any real uh, so-called leftist parties in South Korea because they are all banned due to the NSA, the National Security Act. Uh, yeah, I, I, so I, I heard that like uh, the, around that time, there was some like famous podcasters in South Korea and they were sent to jail or something because they said some good things about North Korea. Am I right? Uh, I think that I remember that right. Yes, yes. so time... the lawmaker named Is Isoki was part of the Unified Progressive Party. He was sent to jail for about nine years in the early to uh, late 2000s due to protesting and uh, one supporting the DPRK and forming this massive protest against the South Korean government. So he was sent to jail, the party was disbanded, and right now the 2022 elections are coming up. They're all full of liberals, obviously. But Young, you know, people will say, especially Americans, what, what about K-pop? You know, look, K-pop is so popular, you know, taking over the world. Soft power, you know, you get, you, that's how you get soft power because you you have, you work with the U.S. and then, you know, you're part of the liberal world. Obviously, what? the South Korean economy only flourished because it was ad aiding Western colonialism. Like back in the 60s, uh, Park Jung he was the fascist leader oh, of Korea. He, he obviously sent <laughs> he sent Korean men to Vietnam to kill communists. That's how South Korea has uh, the South Korean economy has flourished during the past seven decades by one aiding Western colonialism and two the subjugation of women because of you know military prostitution. And these are the things that are not being talked about when discussing Korean politics, economy, whatever, with liberals. They completely neglect these things. Uh, yeah. I, think, I was just going to say, as someone, um, I, I've, New Zealand is often seen as one of those countries that's, you know, peace and love, whatever. Uh, it's same, same sort of like fake image as Canada has. Um, but it's actually kind of yeah. sickening how, like, looking at our behavior during the, um, you know, the 20th century, something that horrified me is just how complicit we were in the Korean War and the Vietnam War as well. Like, as well as supplying troops to both of those, um, uh, we literally were one of the producers of Agent Orange. Like, we, we, we have a chemical Ooh. plant here that, yeah... Yeah, like we we literally were suppliers for like ingredients for making uh, Agent Orange that was used in Vietnam. Uh, the chemical plant um, that they were made in uh, was like it was shut down. I think like twenty years or so ago now, but like they they've been trying to demolish it for years, but they can't because the earth beneath it is just poisoned because they made Agent Orange. Um, yeah, like uh, I remember another thing learning from me. Um, uh, like e even even Maori uh, soldiers were utilized in these, um, and it was always under the under the guise that uh, our military was there for humanitarian aid. We we didn't do shit. <laughs> we we kind of just stood there and took up room, um, and and we 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 aided in in killing. Um, in killing the people, they're killing communists. Um, it was, it's like horrifying. <laughs> just like, just like, I, I don't know how New Zealand even gets away with, um, like keeping up the image that it has. Like, aside from being 
a colon like a colonized country with a an indigenous population who have been resisting that for as long as the po they possibly can um it's just the violence that we're willing to do um at the beck and call of united states and the uk um like these days not uh, well we seem to not do so much but we're literally in five eyes um and yeah uh god I, it's I, I kind of feel like i'm going in circles but maybe but um yeah uh no. you know i could just jump in maybe um because you know as a hawaiian also you know in hawaii uh like i said earlier and cha kind of alluded to we have to internally decolonize ourselves like part of the sad thing about you know, even just as a, as a, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm Hawaiian and Asian and I also have some settler, uh, white settlers in my, in my, in my background, but, um, you know, I, I'm a member of the Hawaiian nation and, uh, but I, you know, as somebody who is Hawaiian identifies as Hawaiian, we have a lot of be part of them when they banned the language, when they banned the culture, when they rewrote all of history and they, they forced us in Hawaii and, uh, you know, and, um, you know, you know, it, it is a thing that was done to us. We, they removed our education and they told us you're all Americans, put your hand over your heart. Right say your national anthem right you speak english only my parents are beaten for speaking for speaking hawaiian um you you will be american and you will respect it as the greatest country in the world you will i mean believe these wrong things about it like you will believe that it it, it, it the korean war was a liberation and america is the greatest human rights and freedom and democracy defending country and that is like deeply ingrained unfortunately in a lot of hawaiians my own parents even like um deny like they they're like we're americans we're just brown you know, it's very sad. It make, it kinda, it, it's sad for me to watch. But I myself, I didn't realize, you know, I was I was supposed to go be a programmer for a huge bank in New York. That's what I was supposed to do. I went to a private school only because my dad taught there uh, and uh, went across the school from uh, one of the world's greatest war criminals, President Obama. Right. Right there. Twenty thousand dollars a year. Private fancy school. I was supposed to go to to uh, Wall Street, but um, to be an American plundering. Right. For all of the while the empire is blowing up. Right. And, and but if you didn't, if I didn't do that, I would have joined the military. That's what we're expected to do. And it's very sad. And we have to be real that like, while that's the reality that the U.S. has forced upon us, we still have to individually and, and collectively, right, as Hawaiians fight back. And we can't just be like, well, I'm just going into the military because I need some money right now. I mean, if everybody just puts their head down and we don't do what we can to resist and say, no, I I, I, I want to shut down Red Hill, you know, and not just not just right now, but I mean, I want the U.S. military and I want the United States to follow the U.N. A high commissioner on human rights that have actually said the U.N. has declared Hawaii is an illegal military occupation and a fraudulent annexation. And the United States military must withdraw. And the government of Hawaii is the sovereign country of Hawaii. And the United States state of Hawaii is a legal fiction. That is the United Nations. Uh, uh, that is the United Nations answer to that question. Right. The United States stands in flagrant violation of international law. And that's why I always open my, whatever I say things and uh, my, my introductions with, I'm, a, I'm in a legally occupied country because that's technically what well, we still are. Our minds are still occupied, sadly, by too much of the United States. And I think that if enough, if and this is a different in every, you know, the states of the United States have to figure out their own reality and maybe there's another path forward for Hawaii. But uh, at this moment, it's like, we have to understand that like the United States does not have our interests in mind. And working with the U.S. military to to uh, some of our activists have flown the same planes that bombed, unfortunately, Luna's family. Uh, I actually know some the people I've worked with activists who are 70 years old. And they, I, I am trying to fight the U.S. empire because I did atrocities in Vietnam as a native Hawaiian. Dr. Keanu Tsai, who sue, is suing the United States in international court, um, uh, as a, he is a former U.S. military uh, officer. He operated in the Gulf. And he said, I am overthrowing democracies in the Middle East for the United States as a military officer. I am trying to destroy democracies. I'm destroying countries for their fossil fuel, for their resources, for U.S. hegemony. And this is what America did to Hawaii. He didn't find out until later that he came back because the United States doesn't teach its own history. Right. They, don't, they, don't tell, they didn't tell you that, um, that the U.S. Navy came and took Hawaii. Right. They did tell you that, oh, Hawaiians were these backwards little living in mud huts, no electricity, and America saved you. Right. And then you join the military. But maybe later on, you accidentally read the wrong book. Right. You listen to the wrong Hawaiian activist and you learn, oh, my gosh, wait, you're telling me that we're actually worse off than we were at that time. And I'm helping to do what America did to my Hawaiian country, to this Middle Eastern country in Afghanistan. 
I'm committing atrocities. I'm not actually bringing freedom and democracy. I'm actually the I'm actually Emperor Palpatine. I'm the stormtrooper. I'm the Empire. And uh, that's a you know that's a realization I had to have at one point because at one point I would I would have told you oh I love America it's democracy and North Korea is China is some kind of authoritarian authoritarian backwards country and communism is terrible I would have told you that because that's what we're all trained and indoctrinated there's no education system there's only a mass uh, uh, disinformation and indoctrination system in the West it's very sad and uh, that's the reality but we have to fight that and it's hard when you're in it because you know you got to work for someone but we have to do our best to fight against that. And, um, and, uh, uh, and that includes like, Hey, I, my own family, I have to tell them like, you, 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 please stop working for the, you know, let's try to find something else for you to do other than blowing the world up for money, you know, or, 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 or blowing the world up financially with sanctions at wall street or writing CIA propaganda. They're making $500 million bill just to counter the belt and road. Right. Uh, and, um, you know, um, anyways, yeah. I mean, you are you're right, Silver Spook. But the American propaganda is so powerful. It not just brainwashes Americans, but it also brainwashes people around the world. Just like Luna has mentioned, there there are Vietnamese liberals who postulate, oh, what would happen if we unify under South Vietnam? That rings a bell for me because that's the exact same line. Uh, proposed by the Chinese liberals back in 1990s and, and, and 2000. I hear it all the time, like, man, if only the KMT has won the civil war, you know, the whole of China is going to be like developed like Taiwan, you know, it'll be great. We'll be, we'll be friends with America, you know, we get all this technology and, and we will all have like higher salaries, right? I mean, now, but now we're in 2022, you know, China is, it is on its way up and up and develop. The so, wealthiest like I, country on us. Yeah, so it is that, the wealthiest that, country on us. Yeah, that's why I I tell people, time do not stand still. You know, you don't don't think this is it. This is like if you think right now it sucks, but hey, this is not the end of history. We can change it. We can change it for the better. You know. Yeah, totally. Um, I, I'm I'm sorry. I'm I take so up too much done space. with liberals, man. <laughs> So dumb yeah. liberals. I hate liberals so much. J just a few hard evidence. You know, this is why I say I'm waiting for Hawaii. You know, when we get to at some point, we want to we want to win win cooperate more. Like I don't know, Nicaragua, Syria, Cuba, and the other four countries in the last like month and a half that have joined the Belt and Road Initiative uh, for win win cooperation. The historic Palmyra and Aleppo. Laos, that are, like, don't forget Laos. <laughs> Laos, Laos has joined. So you know, uh, mm -hmm. more. It's 130 countries. That's actually more than half the world's countries. Are now in the Belt and Road. Yes, the U.S. has more bases; it has countries bases in more countries than it doesn't. But the Belt and Road, you know, it's kind of like the chess players versus the Go players. One is trying to connect the world, uh, and the other one is trying to conquer the world. But, but you know, as Carl said, like the the, the this is only a 150 year. Like I said, 1850 was where the East fell below the economic opium after the Opium Wars and the the, the, the colonial uh, degradation went uh, reversed the East from being the greatest economic block to the West. And it's only been less than 200 years and it's already reversed So 2008 or 10 or 12. If you go by purchasing power parity, uh, it's already around 10 and 12. And definitely China in purchasing power parity within the 20 teens. So that's already reversed. China already has artificial suns for a thousand seconds, 120. I was like, every time I look at the news, I'm like, oh my gosh, they're, they're blasting ahead. Kind of like what socialist countries, when you're not burdened with needless hereditary aristocracies and oligarchies, you, you're just able to produce really fast, you know, uh, uh, and 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 they they've got artificial suns. They've got like fifty thousand kilometers high speed rail. They're connecting. They're giving alternative non depth trap based methods of win win development. Uh, they're integrating all these countries and um, their internal poverty alleviation. One point four billion people out of absolute poverty accounts for like seventy percent of all the population uh, alleviation on planet Earth for like decades. It's like the it is like it's like it's it's criminal like how underknown this is in the West. It's like if you could just only learn to cooperate. You know, so many hundreds of millions of people in the U.S. and 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 uh, in other places that are suffering under the capitalist structures would be so much uh, better off. And anyway, I think that I think that just, they will. Just, yeah. just look at the COVID response. I mean, just look at the COVID response of say China and or Vietnam versus U.S. and U.K. I mean, it's it's like day day and night difference. It's it, it, people that I think that is why U.S. now have to spend five hundred million dollars to do propaganda because you know if you let all these success stories to filter down to people's public consciousness people are going to ask questions why can't we have that 
You know, why can't we have high speed rails in United States, right? Why, 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 exactly. why, why are we? Yeah, why are we letting nine hundred thousand Americans die from a from a, a, a preventable disease? And and this is this is a question that that our government, our elite, don't want us to ask. So instead, we get bombarded with this propaganda. Is like. Oh, communists are bad. Communism is bad. It's authoritarian. Exactly. We live in freedom. We have the freedom to choose. Yes, and democracy. The yeah, we we offer you we offer you freedom to die. You know, we <laughs> offer. That's what they're doing. With the uh, with like the COVID stuff, we for quite a while we had a like we had a pretty robust uh, lockdown strategy, and it was actually mm. doing us pretty good for quite a while. Um, and then we went into lockdown around August of last year, and um, and after about a month, they just gave up. Like the 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 American and British propaganda got to the government, and they were just like, "Oh, wow. we have we, we can't do this anymore." And so now we're in this oh. we're in this new system that they refer to as traffic light, but the difference between the three colors of the traffic light are like they they're like barely there at all like you like we may as well not have wow. the lockdown at all at this point because you're making other anglo countries looking bad you know you're, you're well, exactly <laughs> yeah like <laughs> like, like, yeah. like 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 there's so many media outlets over in the states that were uh portraying our prime minister as some kind of like communist dictator and i'm just like oh, I, I, I wish <laughs> I, <laughs> I i wish that were the case but uh no she is she is at the beck and call of the business sector, just like any other Western leader. Yeah, that's what they, that's what they say about Canada. Oh, I mean, that's having huge anti, you know, anti-COVID uh, vaccine masking, uh, you know, actions. They're saying it's China. The convoy like, thing. Yeah. 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 And, you know, they're accusing them of like you, you're giving in to uh, that's that unites all of the right wing, uh, even in the, the U.S. and in Canada. It's like, you know, uh, you, 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 you know, you, you're going to make us into an authoritarian tanky country uh you're oh. going to make us into a horrible <laughs> communist dictatorship making us get normal just normal shots like when you're you know but no that's the freedom to let 900,000 people die i guess you know <laughs> and that's that's like yeah. so so typical of the uh you know the anglo west right now like the <clears throat> canada the, the the trucker convoys financed by you know oligarchs billionaires right uh, it, it's a, it's a shit fight between these different billionaire groups right now uh, you know a fight yeah. among elite basically they're using we, the common people the, the discontent of common people to fight among themselves and and it is a complete shit show and they tell us this is a freedom we're offering you <laughs> yeah they, they, uh, the thing we, is that's when i watch oh, uh, uh, real, real quick like when i watch this like uh protests and the police and the government i can't help but have like very evil reactions like let them fight just let them fight. Yeah. Uh, o o over here, we actually have a copycat uh, convoy that, that went from... Oh. Uh, ga ga gathered a bunch of people as they drove towards the uh, capital. Um, and they've all been camping out on the lawns at the front of Parliament. Um, it's It was it, it, it was like a poorly organized mess. Like, the there's two different factions inside of the convoy that are constantly infighting um mainly because one of them uh are just your regular run-of-the-mill conspiracy theorists who have been suckered into this um and then the other half is like literally white supremacists um like like the other half like one of the main uh media things doing live streams there um is actually a uh, media company owned by Steve Bannon, uh, former Trump advisor. Um, for some reason he thought, oh, you know, this place looks like a good place to set up camp. We'll, we'll do we'll do that there. Um, I guess uh, he's been trying to like propagandize people since we have our lock well had our lockdowns, um, and it worked for some people, but. Even the media here, uh, I think they do a disservice to this because they, they, in some ways, they kind of make it seem like the uh, anti-vax stance and all that kind of stuff is popular when, like, polling, constant polling around the country has shown that uh, anti-vax sentiment is, like, a deeply unpopular stance to have here. 
um like we, we were all fine with the lockdowns it's just that they were asking the worst possible people their opinions yeah the new zealand i think on average are smarter than than americans <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll give them that. I mean, it's not. My, <laughs> I mean, it's somewhat of an improvement, but mm, sometimes it's a low bar. I know, I know, it's a low bar. I but... mean, like compared to the US right now, it's super low bar. The minimum bar that you can take. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, uh, oh! I we have some super chats. We have some oh, yeah. super chats that I want to address it real quick. Um. First is a chat uh, from Sir Sir Lava. Talk about reminds me of Native American uh, forest uh, fire control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I learned about how Native Americans like control the forest fire, it's fascinating, and I am so like really frustrated with a bunch of you know capitalists, you know, own like just buying shitload of forest land and then they don't do anything to protect or to preserve it. So whenever there's Wi-Fi, they just like run freely, and it's literally destroy half of the USA. It's the same deal in uh, Australia as well. The indigenous uh, uh, tribes in Australia they all had their own methods of um, uh, of basically farming the forest um, uh, with controlled fires, um, which they needed to do because Australia is a really fucking hot country. Where fires just constantly yeah. happen, and it's almost, almost, it's like a near yearly thing where you'll, where it'll be in world news that there's a big fire happening in Australia, and it's because they don't look after the um what forests they do have, and so they let all this dry brush just sit there, and then it ends up becoming just kindling for another big fire, and then yet more people die, um, yet more koalas and kangaroos. Uh, burned to death it's mm. it, this yeah. cannot go yeah. on exactly i mean yeah and they call us you know um barbaric or something but like actually they are the one who really really, really like like are destroying destroying our environment the next uh super chat coming from Jairo Souza. red live watching you from brazil amazon reason a lot of things in common when it comes to ancestralities and decolonization. Yes, Brazilian is a country that's also under, you know, um, the U.S. hegemony and also under really a fascist regime with Bolsonaro by way for our Bolsonaro. And hope that the election in Brazil this year will make some change. I do hope that. I mean, I mean, or else. Look at our comrades in Brazil. I'm very concerned and worried and hope that you can do something to change the situation over there. But look at and looking at what's going on in Chile and Bolivia, you know, in Peru too, does it does give us some hope and hope that Brazil can have the same pattern like that. Yeah, like I, I, it's it's becoming like really clear over the years, over the last couple of years, that uh, uh, the U.S.'s uh, Monroe Doctrine is uh, falling to pieces, uh, it's crumbling in their hands. They just, it's, it, they don't have the, the, they don't have the staying power that they used to have in Latin America. Yeah, you know, actually, that's you know, just just to get back on the you know, to the imperialism and to tie that back in, it's. Um... The, the U.S.'s, you know, uh, capacity to continue to, you know, uh, exhort, you know, and just the, 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 the capitalist colonialist world, the U.S. is just the current champion of it, you know, in a succession of British, Spanish, et cetera, empires. But, you know, um, some people say, well, now we're going to have the next empire. But it's a very important point to make, which I was trying to allude to with the kind of like the, the chess versus go where uh, the Western game of chess is about, you know, well, China is an imperialist country, so we have to we have to stop. We have to just like dismantle every government. Vietnam, no more government. China, you should get rid of your government. Uh, you know, North and South Korea, no government. Every, you know, but it's like, um, not to say that they don't have any problems. They right? all tanky, so we have to support the USA. Yeah, Fighting yeah. Against you, the you, tankies. That, that, that's a tactic that the what the capitalist colonizer world uses inside of the United States because it has it does have a very abusive, unjust government to say 
you should support overthrowing all these other ones and share all of this, you know, uh, CIA, uh, BBC article and, you know, or things that you think are uh, going to help, but you're actually not. And it's important to have more of these. Why I wanted to do these panels is so you can get the information directly from the people who are in the countries, um, you know, particularly for, you know, uh, you know Jan, uh, Carl, Luna, uh, you know, all of us. I, I'm, I'm an indigenous person from Hawaii to to get the information from the sources um, that can give you a, not, we're not that like, like, not like we're all like perfect sources are going to give you the absolute truth that like we all have our own personal position, but I like get information from the people that can tell you actually about how, and especially Carl, because Carl has lived in the US and in China. Luna is like a partner with an American uh, expatriate. And, and so you can get like the, 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 the a better picture of what's actually happening. I have a doctor there. philosophy in US, UK. <laughs> who can, exactly. can like, scout my what? Certified USA expert, certified <laughs> USA watcher. <laughs> there you go. And so, you know, so, um, you know, uh, so, so we can like look and compare and, and, and you can see, you know, the, the difference is that they're trying to stop you from seeing because the US is very, is very vulnerable right now. It can't continue to, to, to get its way. Like, like I just said, there were like four countries already uh, turning against the colonial capitalist uh, order. Usually they can, with sanctions, war and propaganda, they can usually as Elon Musk would say, coup whoever they want, right? When he told the Bolivians, uh, you know, it didn't help us when you back the coup for our lithium. And he said, well, deal with it. We'll coup whoever we want. He said that on Twitter. I mean, weird, weird flex, bro. You're giving away the game. Anyway, so, um, but uh, but but now that that failed. This is important. Bolivia is actually an important example for, uh, it, it's an indigenous, it's a it's a, it's a Western hemisphere because Luna talks about decolonization. That's why Luna and I made the game Decolonators that you, you can play and learn about kicking capitalists. <laughs> That's a that's a sweet ass game, by the way. I recommend everybody go check it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you kick capitalist colonizer butts out of Vietnam, uh, uh, you know, with 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 tanks, you know, and you can scare a bunch of fake Western leftists uh, with your with your giant tank. Um, but you know, it's historically accurate Soviet PT seventy six tank. You know, um, it goes a little faster maybe than the original. But um, you, can, anyway. you can play the real tanky. <laughs> <They're real. laughs> John McCain, his John McCain's brother, he got shot. But, you know, um, but anyways, yeah. So the Colonators is a, it's a comedy game, but I'm trying to I'm trying to in a game way teach people, you know, hopefully in the English Anglo world, you know, some his a little bit of history, you know, and who is the actual, you know, if Star Wars doesn't make it clear that it's the U.S. is the West is the Empire, and you're kind of this is the bad guys. The Colonators is about this is the actual good guys, you know, instead of playing. You know, so you, you you get a sense of history, and then and but also a modern version of decolonization that is it's it's undoing colonialism and capitalism is uh, look look closely at Bolivia, you know uh, the success of their movement. I, I would keep a close eye because uh, uh, for for you know I I have, uh, I have like people that I know that um, are of Bolivian descent. Actually, the game I'm, I make video games. That's what I mostly do, and I have game developers who are indigenous people in Paraguay, Colombia, Bolivia, uh, and anyways. So, and they were like, you know, we're having a lot of success here and we undid Elon and the U.S. back coup. They tried to coup us two more times and we undid it with like, with, 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 um, we had Marxist economists and indigenous, indigenous and left leadership. And uh, we have strong unions and organization and, 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 and under environmental degradation that was all coming together in their, in their uh, agro business and uh, Canadian and U.S. companies trying to get their way with collaborators in the country. And Bolivia has had re recent successes. Uh, again, Peru, uh, there have been other more successful projects. Um, and an interesting concept, uh, just one thing you might want to read is, uh, uh, I have a friend, Nua Mauta, who is a uh, uh, Quechua. He's, a, he's an indigenous Marxist Leninist from, uh, or indigenous leftist, and he understands, uh, you know, uh, uh, He's, he identifies as an indigenous leftist, but he also understands Marxist Leninist uh, theory from um, Bolivia. And uh, and he had a podcast with Nick uh, Estes, who is an indigenous person and also a leftist from um, from North America, right, in the United States. And it's important for people to understand that there, there is an alternate way under what's called like a plur, it's a plurinational, plurinational uh, socialist uh, state that the Bolivia has where you have different languages, different people. Um, you know, kind of similar. I mean, it's kind of similar to what I was talking about with Hawaii and it bears some similarities to what is in places like China and Vietnam, where you allow people to have different cultures and languages, right. Uh, that coexist within a country. I mean, of course, when we get to a, a reality where we don't need states, classes and money, et cetera, we will have a stateless classes, money, a society, but on the way there, um, 
Uh, anyway, so people are like, well, Silver Spook, what do I concretely do in the United States? Well, I mean, number one, I mean, you can, you can, I recommend check out that podcast. It's very illuminating. And, and uh, it is a process because of course you, you can't decolonate in the way that decolonator shows in Vietnam. It's not the same material reality in the United States or in South American, you know, in Brazil or et cetera. But they're important, again, uh, just to read it, lessons about how we can deal with colonialism, capitalism, imperialism, as the United States uh, uh, and the West, uh, are, are they're losing their grip. And there are larger, uh, the, 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 the pendulum of history is swinging in our direction. And we should try to, you know, as a native Hawaiian who, you know, knows ocean and waves, surf the wave, you know, and, 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 and work with our international partners that are growing in, in, in their, in their, in their uh, economic strength. Now, they're not, they're not going to militarily take over, but they are going to, um, they are outplaying the capitalists and imperialists. And there's a lot of sad white tears right now, but uh, we have to drink them up and then uh, figure out how we can work together and, um, and build, uh, build, build, you know, build socialism, as Luna would say in the game. Exactly. Uh, and then you look know, like, uh, real, real quick, a funny point, that like white people, listenly, this is the one white person in America told me this. What are you talking about? 99% Vietnamese people are Vietnamese. So like, I mean like that's like, we have, we know different, like, what are you talking about? We, we, we have a 54 ethnic minorities. And you know that each of, each of my ethnic minority have their own language, their own culture, right? So like the amount of racism and ignorance is like over the top. I, that's it, that's it. Yeah, welcome to America the most indoctrinated country on earth. Literally, yes, 99% of Vietnamese who live in Vietnam are Vietnamese, yeah, right? But it doesn't mean we have the exact same language and the exact same culture, you racist. Uh, oh, actually we are at the end of our show. Um, it's so great to talk to you and time flies. So um, uh, let's have our guests Let's hear our guest final message to the audience. Uh, to the audience. So let's start from Kasha. What's okay, your final just, message today? Okay, just remember, U.S. is the evil empire in the Star Wars, and just just ignore all the propaganda you <laughs> in the U.S. media about other countries because you know there's so much propaganda. It's it's going to be tough for you to sift from the, the the facts from the fiction. But you, you guys who live in the imperial core, you know your country very well. You know your local context, right? So get organized, you know, fight the injustice in your own locality, in your own region, in your own country, you know, link up with like-minded people. And, um, you know, if you have time, by all means, educate yourself uh, as much as you can, you know, reach out, seek out the different uh, perspective. Uh, a lesson to a different alternative view but what you can do as leftist you you can actually have much more impact within your own country within your own regions by you know organize protest do whatever you need to do get educated um you know then worry about all these like cia astroturf uh, you know humanitarian interventions in in the, in the other part of the world that's like 99% of that just is just made up propaganda uh, is, is to, to set you up to, to cheerleading for war, which is last thing you want to do. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, Jan, what do you want to say to the audience today? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me here. Um, you know, get America out of Korea. Reunification <laughs> will occur exactly. in my lifetime. Korea is one. The U.S. illegally invaded Korea in the 50s, you know, raped our women, killed our men, gave our children no future to look forward to. It owes us $500 million just for the environmental damages it has caused us. Imagine how much more money they owe us just for committing genocide and starting a war. You know, we deserve reparations. We deserve to have our country back, to be unified, get America out of Korea. America out of Korea. Absolutely. My solidarity to you, Jan. Hope that Korea 
hope that one day we can call Korea, Korea, and hope that you can be unified as Vietnam did. Yeah, bad wishes for you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, John, for being here. It's my honor to finally have the chance to talk to you. Uh, well, uh, yeah, Ron, what do you want to say here? Uh, well, first of all, it was uh, it was awesome time here. I was uh, I love love the conversations happening. Um, uh, I think as well, uh, I would to to the to our colonized indigenous out there. We have a world to win. Um, kia kaha. Uh, and uh, I guess I'll finish off with a a a, a, a quote that is often. Uh, used amongst Maori and has kind of been a bit of a driving force for us as well. The, and the, the phrase is kafafai tonu mato ake ake ake, which uh, translated into English means our struggle is without end, on and on and on. Um, so yeah, <laughs> thanks for having me here. Yeah, it's nice, very nice to talk to you and um, thank you so much for your message. So what about you, Super Spook? Um, What's yeah, your message? yeah, uh, yeah, number one, yeah, thanks, thanks, number one, Luna, uh, mahalo for uh, hosting uh, this panel. Um, thanks everybody. I, I, I apologize, I was uh, uh, didn't get the exact time right, so I'm, I'm sorry if I'm keeping you from your uh, family or business uh, uh, you know, responsibilities if we got the time wrong. Uh, but um, thank you so much to everybody, uh, you know, Shah, who's already gone, Yaron, uh, uh Carl. Uh, Jan, uh, for, for participating, um, you know, again, you know, as a native Hawaiian, like we are being directly impacted by the imperialism as we speak. It's very, it's more real than it's been, you know, it's always been real for us here, but it's, you know, we're our, again, so I'm wearing this shirt, um, shut down Red Hill tanks, right? That's one of our organizing and actions we're trying to do directly to the U S military. Uh, that's poisoning, uh, thousands of our Hawaiian people and their own soldiers, as part of an ongoing process of colonialism and, and, and just horrible actions. And so, um, so it really means a lot because this, I do think this will help to um, make some beneficial, uh, uh, make some, I hope that some people, at least some people got educated watching this and um, in your own countries, as Carl said, like do what you can do. Um, and, uh, and also I hope that we have more conversations and uh, yeah, I like Korea. I hope that, the illegal occupation of the United States, uh, you know, I'm just going to say the illegal occupation of the United States empire, right, will will end. And what becomes of that, uh, it will not be the empire that it is today, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in my lifetime. I, I want to say that because, I mean, the world doesn't really have an option under a capitalist military industrial complex run uh, nightmare. So we really have we only have one option, which is to fully get to a uh, uh, for climate, for covid for war, nuclear annihilation, all these things cannot be dealt with without getting to a cooperative win-win decolonized, uh, 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 you know, world rather than a win-lose colonial extractive world. The, the world itself, the Aina cannot handle that. So, um, and uh, yeah, so anyway, thank you so much. Uh, mahalo, Nui Loa, and uh, yeah, free Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. And yeah, free Hawaii too. Hands off Hawaii and hands off South Korea too. Um, to uh, be before I end this uh, stream, I want to uh, thank say thank you so much to uh, to Hiro. So that again, uh, thank you for your super chat. Uh, the message is thank you guys so much for such an inspiring and thought provoking life. Cheers from Amazon Brazil. Feeling blessed to find you here. Oh, thank you so much. And make sure to follow and subscribe to all the channels and the Twitter accounts of our guests here today. And before I end this, I have a very short a legend of Vietnamese people that I want to share all to you. Uh, once upon a time, there was a prince, which was also a dragon, live under the water. He decided to... Um, to leave his home and move to the land which is the north of Vietnam today. And he met a fairy and they got married and they had a hundred children. After a while, uh, they uh, separated. I mean, I is it saying like this is the first divorce in the history of Vietnam. They got divorced and then the husband took 50 of the children to the ocean 
and leave. And the 50 children stay with the mother, the fairy, and become Vietnamese people today. We don't have any more information about the other 50 children who follow our dragon father. But my conspiracy is this. What if maybe indigenous people, Hawaiian, Maori, are the 50 like, children who follow our dragon father to go live in the sea? So maybe Super Spook and Zaron, we are all lost brothers and sisters. Who knows? <laughs> so, That's why we have the same, that is a very same words. interesting. We 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 You're just right? got re yeah. we, we just got really good at sailing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like we we lost we lost contact with the fifty children that follow our dragon father. So maybe we are still looking for them. So maybe you are, maybe you are the descendants of those children. But that is just a fun lesson uh, of Vietnamese people, and so happy to to be here and to have you all in my panel. I hope that in the future I can have you back to talk uh, more about the same stuff and also the we'll, you know, future topics. We'll, we'll keep talking until the U.S. empire is gone. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm sorry, white people. If you feel tired, I'm sorry we can't stop talking about this until you actually do something to end its existence, okay? Well, we have to keep like screaming to your ears about Gotta how horrible you guys are. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Uh, see you next time. Bye bye. Okay. I'm ending the stream right now.